morning. At long last, all of my previous preaching commitments are done, and I am here with you for as long as you need me every week. And I am so thankful and grateful. Also, today we're going to begin um, doing a children's sermon right on the non-communion Sundays. So Delta, you get to come up and have some time with me and any other kids that are here. And uh, then I want to share something with you. Um, this is a congregation that loves the liturgy and uses the liturgy in a wonderful way to, to frame our worship. And the worship connects, and the liturgy connects us to, to the, all the saints who have gone before us in a wonderful way. And the liturgy is indeed beautiful. But, beloved, the, the liturgy is so much more than that. The liturgy actually teaches us how to live our lives as Christ followers. And so, in our welcome over the next several weeks, I, I want to share with you how each part of the liturgy teaches us how to live our lives. So, this morning, I want to start with, with two parts of the liturgy. The confession and absolution. We come to church, we begin our worship this way, we ask for God's forgiveness, and He forgives us. But even more importantly than that, as, as important as that is, that part of the liturgy teaches us about reconciliation and the importance of reconciliation. We learn how to ask for forgiveness, how to give forgiveness, and the really difficult part, how to receive forgiveness. So this is critical for our life together as a congregation. We need to learn how to ask forgiveness from each other and to receive forgiveness from each other. And that's what the, the liturgy does for us, this confession and absolution. It's critical for our life together as a congregation, for our families, and for living our life with our neighbors. So think about that as we go through the confession and absolution. We learn reconciliation. Second, we have this single little line we call the invocation. And I'm very intentional. The traditional way to say it is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You hear me say we come into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's because the preposition in Greek is into, not just in. And it reminds us that God is welcoming us into his presence, that we are surrounded by the presence of God. We're in God's house, and he welcomes us with open arms. The invocation, that single line, teaches us hospitality. God is a welcoming God, and he's welcoming us into his house and into his presence, and he teaches us to be a welcoming people into our worship, into our events, into our families, into our neighborhood, right? We learn how to be welcoming people from that invitation. So I hope you'll bear, bear with me in the Sundays ahead as we walk through the liturgy and think about how the liturgy teaches us how to live our lives as Christ's followers. Again, this is God's house. He is present here. He invites us into his presence. He welcomes us with open arms. He's eager to speak to us, to forgive us, to bless us. He's eager to hear our prayers, our thanksgiving, and praise. And so we rise and join together in the confession and absolution. Beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. against you in thought, word, and deed, 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We rise and join together in the entrance hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
Grant us always to recognize your goodness. Give thanks for your compassion and praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you should be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and kill, cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him and said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The word of the Lord.
there's one of the, there's the ten lepers, right? And Jesus cleansed them all. But one of them came back because he recognized that not only was he, his skin cleansed, but he got something even more precious. And we're going to talk about that in this sermon, all right? And so he was thankful, not just for being cleansed of his leprosy, but for the other gifts Jesus gave him too. And so, we'll talk about that in the sermon, but I have a box of Cracker Jack here, and there is a prize inside. I don't think there's two tickets to this game. <laughs> oh, that's okay. But there is a prize, right? And that makes us extra, extra thankful. So that's for you, and let's pray to you. God, we come to you today thankful for your many blessings in our life. You give us so many good gifts. You give us one thing and we're thankful, and you give us something even better and we're thankful, and then you give us forgiveness in Jesus, and we're even more thankful. You give us so much to be thankful for. And we pray this day that you would indeed help us to show our thanks and to express our thanks to you in every way. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We join in singing the sermon hymn, which is a wonderful response to our reading this morning, especially that epistle reading from Paul to Timothy. So as we sing to him, think about those words of our epistle reading. because of Jesus the Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, our readings this morning once more focus our attention on how to live our lives as Christ followers. 
Again, how does the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus change us and transform the way we live our lives? All three of our readings this morning show us God's faithfulness in our lives, even when we may be faithless. He is always, always faithful. He brings healing and wholeness, mercy, grace, and salvation into our lives. He gives us everything we need to live our lives faithfully for Him. In our Old Testament reading this morning, we see God use Elisha to heal Naaman, the foreigner, of his leprosy. And in our Gospel reading this morning, we see Jesus heal not just one, but ten lepers, including a foreigner. And then finally, in our Epistle reading this morning, Timothy, Paul gives Timothy and us a trustworthy saying that we as Christ followers can truly build our lives on. In Jesus, God is faithful. No matter what's going on in our lives, God is faithful. So, beloved, let's dig deeper. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the second book of Kings, the fifth chapter. And here we have the story of Elisha healing Naaman, the commander of a foreign army, from his leprosy. The writer of Kings describes him this way. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Our translation was said Syria, same country. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Leprosy, that dreaded disease, means not only the end of his military career, but the end of any kind of meaningful life. He's doomed to live as an outcast from his family and from his community with virtually no human interaction at all, except with other lepers. His life is over, and he knows it. But then the Lord who had given him his military victories intervenes in his life, even though he's a foreigner and an unbeliever. Isn't it God can be faithful in the lives who don't even know him yet? And the Lord's intervention comes in the most unusual way, in the humblest of ways. The Lord's intervention comes through the spoils of war. You see, Aramite raiders had taken captive a young Israelite girl and brought her back to Aram, where she became the servant girl of Naaman's wife. And this young girl, when she learns of her master's leprosy, says to his wife, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman goes to the king of Aram and asks for permission to do what this servant girl suggested. And the king says, by all means, go. And he even writes a letter to the king of Israel and sends with Naaman gifts of gold and silver and rich clothing. Now the king of Aram gets things confused a little bit. His letter asks the king of Israel to cure Naaman of his leprosy. And the king knows there's no way in the world he can cure Naaman. So immediately he thinks the king of Aram is setting a trap. Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send me someone to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? But when Elisha hears what's happened, he sends a message to the king saying, Have the man come to me, and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman comes with all his chariots and retinue to Elisha's house. And Elisha 
sends a messenger out to Naaman. And this messenger tells Naaman to do a very, very simple thing. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman is angry, and he's angry for two reasons. First, he's offended that Elisha didn't even come out to speak to him himself. He sent a messenger instead. After all, Naaman's the commander of a powerful army. He's the right-hand man of the king. Why would Elisha slight him so? And second, He's angry that he told to wash in the Jordan River. Why did he travel so far only to be told to wash in a river that's barely a river at all? There are certainly much bigger and better rivers back home. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? He cries. And then he storms off in a rage. But Naaman's servants go to him and say, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman gives in. He goes and washes himself seven times in the Jordan River, and lo and behold, he's cleansed. His leprosy is gone. His skin is restored. In fact, his skin is like that of a little baby. Naaman returns to Elisha and exclaims, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Beloved, what a powerful story of God's faithfulness in the life of a captured servant girl, in the life of Elisha, and in the life of Naaman, this foreigner who experienced for himself God's faithfulness. God's mercy, God's grace in such a wonderful way. Beloved, I've seen with my own eyes this very story lived out in a wonderful and powerful way. Years ago, I was leading a mission team in Panama. We'd come to Panama to serve Gloria Adiolos Lutheran Church, a young mission congregation building their first church building. And we were there to work beside their church members, building that first building together. And working beside them meant mixing cement by hand. There was this huge pile of sand, a huge pile of concrete, and buckets to put water into. And the men formed a circle, both Americans and Panamanians, each with a shovel in their hand. And then they walked in a circle, singing a hymn, as they used their shovels to mix the sand and mix the cement, and somebody was pouring water on it, and, until finally the mix was just right and ready to be used in laying the bricks. And it didn't take very long at all for the men on our team to begin to grumble profusely. If only we had a cement mixer! We could get this job done so much faster, so much more efficiently, and so much better. Why do we have to do all of this man-blowing? Can you hear the echo of Naaman's frustration in the words of their frustration? Later, at the end of the week, the Panamanian pastor at Gloria Adios preached a very powerful sermon. And he used this story of Naaman as his text. And he told the men on our team, you came here wanting to do a great thing for us. But we wanted you to come and work beside us, to work with us, so that we could build relationships with you as brothers in Christ. We asked you to do a very small thing. And even though you grumbled about it, you still did it. And now look what God has done among us. Yes, we have a new church building, but even more importantly, we now have each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. The men on our team were all in tears 
because they knew that was true. God had done an amazing thing that week. And he had done it in the most unusual way, in the humblest of ways, through manual labor, working together side by side. In the end, all of us exclaim, now we know there's no God in all the earth except our God. Beloved, God is faithful. He does the most miraculous things, often in the most ordinary of ways. And so as Christ followers, we keep our eyes wide open for the little things the Lord asks us to do, knowing that he will indeed work mightily and bring blessings into our lives through these seemingly insignificant things because, well, because that's how he often works. God is faithful. And he's faithfully at work in our lives, bringing us so many blessings through the little things. And that, my beloved, brings us to our gospel reading this morning in Luke, the 17th chapter. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Elijah heals one leper. But here in our gospel reading this morning, Jesus heals ten lepers. He's traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to die. But before he dies, he gives new life to these ten lepers. Luke tells us that as Jesus is about to enter a village, ten men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, says Luke, and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When Jesus sees them, just as Elisha did with Naaman in our Old Testament reading this morning, he tells them to do a very small, a very simple thing. Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they go on their way to see the priests, they're cleansed. Their leprosy is gone. Their skin is restored. And Luke says one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. Beloved, can you hear the echo of Naaman here? And this cleansed leper threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Oh, by the way, this man just happened to be a Samaritan, a foreigner, just like Naaman. The other nine, however, simply continued on their way, heading to see the priest, just like Jesus told them to do. Beloved, this story often shows up in our gospel reading for Thanksgiving. And all too often, we've used it like something of a baseball bat to beat up those who haven't come to our Thanksgiving worship service. Praise God for the few who are here to thank God. Where are all the others? But I don't think that's what this story is about at all. Again, the nine heading straight for the priests are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. And they're doing it full of joy and thanksgiving. The priests will see that their leprosy is gone. Their skin is restored. The priests will declare them clean, which means they no longer have to live exiled lives. They can return home to their families. They can return to their synagogues and communities. They'll have their lives back, something they never, ever thought possible. And they'll give a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving in the temple for this miracle of God's grace in their lives. But the Samaritan who comes back and falls at Jesus' feet, full of praise and thanksgiving, is experiencing something even more wonderful than the nine. The Greek words Luke uses here are very, very telling. There's three different words here. Luke tells us that the ten men as they went on their way to see the priests, were cleansed 
katharizo. It's the word we get catharsis from. But Luke describes the Samaritan who returns to Jesus as having been healed. Iao. Beloved, Iao is a much, much stronger word than just cleanse. Iao is the word used for health and wholeness. In fact, Iao is the root word for words like pediatric and geriatric. I get IA in the middle of those words. Pediatric, health and wholeness for children. Geriatric, health and wholeness for older folk. Again, means health and wholeness. And then finally, at the end of our reading this morning, Luke uses a third word. Jesus says to the Samaritan, your faith has made you well. Well, that's not the best translation. That's not exactly what Luke says here. Luke uses the word sozo which means more than just making someone well, more than cleansing them, more than bringing healing and wholeness into their lives. Sozo literally means to save. So what Jesus really says to this man is this, your faith has saved you. You see, beloved, this grateful Samaritan came back and fell at Jesus' feet, not just because he's been cleansed of his leprosy, but because a heavy, heavy burden has been lifted from his life. He's been set free by Jesus. He's been given the gift of faith. He's experienced salvation in Jesus. Something even more wonderful than being cured of his leprosy. It's the prize in the box with the garbage bag. So instead of running to the priest, he runs to the one who saved him in the fullest sense of the word. Beloved, leprosy can be cured. The bodies of the diseased can be cleansed. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. God's mercy and grace is always wonderful. But the Lord wants to do so much more in our lives than just cleanse our bodies. He also wants to bring healing and wholeness into our lives. He wants to bring his salvation into our lives. He wants to save us in every way possible. God is faithful. And he's faithfully at work, not only in the life of this grateful Samaritan, but in our lives too, bringing mercy and grace, bringing forgiveness, life and salvation into our lives, now and for all eternity. Yes, beloved, God is faithful. And that brings us at last to our epistle reading this morning in Paul's second letter to Timothy, the second chapter. Here, Paul uses the words of a hymn or perhaps a poem to give Timothy and us a trustworthy saying about God's faithfulness in our lives. If we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The first line of this poem reminds us that when we die with Jesus in our baptism, we're raised to new life in Him. And the second line reminds us that enduring with Christ, following Him through thick and thin, has an eternal impact on our lives. And the third line reminds us that if we push Jesus away, that too has an eternal impact on our lives. But then Paul surprises us with the last line. Instead of giving us the line we expect to come next, he gives us a line totally unexpected. He tells us that even if we're faithless, God is faithful. Wow! Beloved, this is great, great good news. 
Our salvation does not depend on our own faithfulness. This side of heaven, we're still both sinners and saints. We have times when we are indeed faithful as Christ's followers, but as we well know, there are also times in our lives when we're somewhat faithless in our walk as Christ's followers. But the good news is this, the Lord keeps his promises to us even when our own promises to be faithful lie shattered on the steps of the church door before we even get home from church. This is clearly the climax of this trustworthy saving. Paul clearly wants us to focus on God's faithfulness in all situations, because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, because we have been united with Christ, because we are indeed the very body of Christ, the Lord cannot deny us. To deny us would be to deny himself. To disown us would be to disown himself. Therefore, God is faithful ever and always faithful. Paul then tells Timothy and us to keep reminding God's people of his faithfulness. Never stop sharing this great good news. God is faithful. And his faithfulness truly transforms the way we live our lives together as the people of God here in this place called Zion. So, there's no need to quarrel among ourselves over words. We pay attention to God's word and do our best to proclaim it fully and faithfully. We avoid godless chatter. We stay focused on the ministry entrusted to our care. Why? Because God's solid foundation stands firm, says Paul. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. God is faithful, and he is indeed faithfully at work in our lives, bringing us healing and wholeness, forgiveness, life, and salvation. Oh, beloved, God is faithful. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We rise and join together in telling the story of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Good and gracious God, we come to you this day praying for your church. For this family of faith called Zion, for all of our sister congregations scattered throughout the city and state and country, for all of our sister congregations in every nook and cranny of this planet, we pray that we might indeed recognize your faithfulness to us and lift our voices and our hearts to you in praise and thanksgiving. Help us to live faithfully in the reality and the wonder and the joy of your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day for those in need. We pray especially.
especially for Kenny and Brian and Nick, for Kirk and Richard and Mark, for Tracy, for Don Myron's friends Peter and Mark and Beverly, and for my friends Kevin and Stacy. We pray that you would wrap your arms up around these people, hold them in the palm of your hand, hold them close to your heart and touch them with your healing hand. We also pray for Kara and Alicia and for Gary. We're so thankful for Gary's successful surgery this past week. And we pray that you would continue to hold him close and bring him to full healing. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who are homebound, for Dolly and Vivian and Ellen and Mark and Ruth. Again, hold them close to your heart, assure them of your presence and love, and use us to be present in their lives, to, to proclaim to them that they are still part of this family called Zion, even though they are homebound, and to to help them experience with us the joy and wonder of God's salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we also pray this day for all those giving thanks. We think of those celebrating birthdays, Jackson and Jill, Nick and Eric and Bruce. We think of those celebrating an anniversary, Chris and Lisa Wagner, today. We also think of Patrick and Risa who celebrated their wedding day yesterday. How you bless us in so many, many ways. Your mercy and grace overflow in our lives, and we give you blessings and thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And finally, O oh Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our president and Congress, for our Supreme Court, for our governor and state legislature, for all our local leaders. You have given them their positions. You have given them authority. And we pray that you would give them wisdom to use that authority for the good of all citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Almighty and merciful God, we have again worshipped in your presence and received both forgiveness for our many sins and the assurance of your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this undeserved grace and ask you to keep us in faith until we inherit eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with a smile of his favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a few announcements. Um, there. All Saints Sunday is coming, and as a congregation, we always remember members of the congregation, family and friends who passed away since our last All Sunday celebration. There's an announcement on the back of the bulletin. Give those names and information either to Lisa or to myself, and uh, we look forward to that special feast of All Saints Day. Second Bible study uh, is now up in the conference room. And we'll be studying the psalm of the day uh, between now and the end of the church year, between now and Thanksgiving. And then we'll start studying the book of Habakkuk during the season of Advent. So please, please come join us. Love to have you there. Also, I will now be in the church office, not just on Tuesdays, but Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so if you need anything, please feel free to, to call or to stop by. I'm here. Finally, Oktoberfest is coming October 30th. Tickets will be on sale. That announcement's on the back as well. Oh, Steve has the tickets in his hand. So see Steve. Looking forward to a great time together. Also, on the back of the on the back page, notice the urgent needs, right? Peanut butter and a laptop. Kind of a strange combination. <laughs> but not together. together. Not together. Not together, no. All right. Any other announcements? If not, we rise and join together in this sending him. Your hand, O Lord, in days of old. <laughs> 